Muy buenos días, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches. Este es Luis Alberto Jovel trayéndole algo que mucha gente me ha pedido que cuándo lo iba a hacer, pero me ha tomado más tiempo porque tengo que pasar el video para que tenga subtítulos. Pero aquí les traigo el video donde yo entrevisto a Donna Fabren, el autor de Vida en la Trinidad, una introducción a la teología con la ayuda de los padres de la iglesia. Eh, este libro es publicado por CLIE, fue originalmente eh, publicado en el 2009 y CLIE lo ha publicado ahora el año pasado, el 2023. Este es un libro, no, no voy a decir mucho de ello porque van a poder ver el link a un PDF que muestra las primeras páginas de este libro, así que van a poder ver eh, lo que se trata el libro, el, el índice del libro, pero también eh, lo que está en contenido. Pero también quisi pero quisiera decir cuántas páginas son, porque hay unas cosas que me llaman la atención. Son 268 páginas, eh, son, eh, me acuerdo que son 10 capítulos... Y porque me acuerdo que lo, lo fu fuimos capítulo por capítulo entrevistando al autor. Eh, sí, son 10 capítulos. Eh, y una de las cosas que, me, que tiene es que tiene el índice de nombres y temas. Que eso ayuda mucho a la lectura. Y luego tiene el índice de citas bíblicas. Que también ayuda grandemente. Así que clíe un 10 por, por, por proveer esta, eh, el, el, los índices al final para así poder tener una lectura más uh, rápida de, del tema. Así que van a poder ver el, la entrevista que le hice a su autor, Dono Fairburn, y es algo que él nos le, le gustó mucho a él, le, le agradó mucho, porque ha tenido dos entrevistas para la audiencia en español, y ninguna de las dos le preguntaron acerca del libro, más bien le preguntaban acerca de un tema específico. Y esta vez él se sintió muy bien, que fuimos capítulo por capítulo, haciendo preguntas de su libro, no de un tema totalmente eh, que no se habla mucho del libro. En sí, el tema, en, en este caso, en nuestro organismo, se habla, pero en las notas al pie y un poquito en el libro. Pero eh, eso fue en las otras um, entrevistas de eso se trató. Pero esta vez ustedes van a poder oír de lo que se trata el libro, qué es lo que piensa el autor acerca de lo que él escribió. Así que yo les invito a que se queden, que vean las notas del video donde pueden eh, ver cómo bajar las primeras páginas del libro eh, gracias a Clie por proveer eso también donde pueden comprarlo tanto en Amazon como en Clie o donde a ustedes les salga más cómodo eh, y haciendo eh, eh, a esas comprándolo por medio de eso usted va a estar ayudando a este canal también y también está en la nota del video donde pueden encontrarme a mí en internet o cómo apoyar este canal así que les invito a que vean esta entrevista Van a estar oyendo a una persona, a un erudito de los padres de la iglesia y van a poder aprender cómo ir un buen, un buen, a, una, buena, una buena entrevista con respecto a un libro y no con respecto a un tema. Aunque, aunque no está nada mal oír temas, pero yo creo que hay que respetar al autor y preguntarle, si uno lo invita a que hable de su libro, preguntarle acerca de su libro, no de otras cosas. Así que. Vean las notas del, del video donde está el PDF eh, disponible de parte CLIA para que ustedes puedan ver de qué se trata el libro. Por eso es que no, no, no hice un, un unboxing en sí, porque CLIA provee las primeras páginas donde ustedes pueden apreciar de qué se trata el libro, eh, la información del libro. Pero sí mencioné lo último, que fue muy bien acerca del índice, donde se da el índice de temas y nombres y el índice de citas bíblicas que es importante que Dios les bendiga y que eh, eh, yo, yo, yo espero que ustedes puedan tomar mucho provecho de, el, de, de este video que también vea cómo la Trinidad nos ayuda a crecer la vida cristiana así como les ayudó a los cristianos de los primeros siglos y que veamos que nosotros como protestantes tenemos tanto derecho de citar y aprender de los padres de la iglesia como cualquier otra eh, expresión cristiana que Dios les bendiga y disfruten el video. We would like to welcome Donna Fairburn to to this channel and um, and also we want to hear from what he has to tell us about his book. Uh, I'd like to show his book. Uh, this is a Spanish speaking interview, but uh, but I'm sure I'm gonna be showing you when I do the introduction also the English one because I haven't got it yet. Vida en la Trinidad o Life in the Trinity. Uh, an introduction, a la, uh, una introducción a la teología con la ayuda de los padres de iglesia, an introduction to theology with the help of the church fathers. 
Donald Fairburn, do, do, do you like this? Uh, do you like this, um, this cover for your book in Spanish? I love it, actually. Yes. Yes, the, yes. The, this cover is in Spanish is very much like the cover in English. Uh, yes. the, the icon up at the top is different, but the rest of it is the same as in English. Most of the other translations, the translation cover doesn't look anything like the English cover. Oh, great, great. So, so, so we're starting a good note. <laughs> um, yeah. and don't, can you tell us about you, where you, where you teach, um, what you do, please? Okay. Yes, my name is, is Donald Fairbairn, and I am a professor of historical theology, especially focusing on the patristic period, which is the period of the early church fathers from the end of the New Testament up until about 600 or 700 A.D., We call that the period mm -hmm. of the Church Fathers or the Patristic Period. I teach at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary in the United States and also at Union School of Theology in Wales. So I do a fair bit of traveling with mm -hmm. my teaching. Um, my, my education has been at Princeton University, my undergraduate degree, which is where I became a believer. And uh, my master's degree, my Master of Divinity is from Denver Seminary both of those in the United States. And my PhD is from the University of Cambridge in England. I've also done a fair bit of missions work. I was a short-term missionary in France and a full-time missionary in Soviet Georgia and in okay. Ukraine at the time that the Soviet Union was breaking apart. And I have continued to teach in many different places in Europe as well. Uh, 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 we have some Ukrainian people in our in our church actually, uh, but she came here when she was little. But she told me that um, that Ukraine used to be like the hub for evangelism in in Eastern Europe. Um, yes, it, it was and probably still is the mm. the greatest center of evangelical Christianity in the former mm. Soviet Union. When I was there in the early 90s, it, it was the golden age of new opportunity for ministry in the mm. former Soviet Union. And I actually helped to start a Bible college, which was later called Donetsk Christian University in Eastern mm. Ukraine, in the city of Donetsk that nobody had ever heard of at that time. Yes. Which I is unfortunately know. famous for all the wrong reasons now. Mm. But our school was actually taken over in the first Russian invasion in 2014. It was mm. turned into a barrack for Russian soldiers. So that school uh, that I helped to start does not exist anymore. So, 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 so sad to hear that I didn't know that. I mean, I, I uh, hear about the Baptists also suffering um, very um, a lot in uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the, well, the th thanks for telling me that. I didn't know that that the seminary turned into barracks uh, or university turned into barracks. A Christian, a, a Christian university turned into barracks. So that's that's sad. Uh, mm -hmm. Well. Thank you. Uh, well, let's talk about then your book. I'd um, uh, like to uh, just uh, talk uh, maybe one or two questions from each chapter, uh, like in, in going to chapter one, Introduction to Eternity. So why do you write this book, Don? There are, there are two reasons why I write the book, and they're connected, but they're not the same. Mm. One was that when I began studying patristics in my PhD program, studying the theology of the early church fathers, I thought this is fascinating. This is so important for our understanding of the gospel. Why is it not ever written about in a way that regular Christians can understand it? Mm -hmm. And so almost as soon as I began my PhD studies, I resolved that someday I would write a book. I've actually written several, but that I would write mm -hmm. a yes. book that would be easy enough to understand that a, a reasonably well-educated Christian would be able to grasp the significance of what the early church was saying about Christ and about the gospel. So that was one reason for writing the book. And another reason for writing the book is that as I look at evangelical Christianity, Protestant Christianity, mm -hmm. we have a very, very relational spirituality as we should. Mm. It's all about personal relationship with God, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But our official soteriology, the official way theologically that we describe salvation is very, very legal or what we call juridical. It is mm. about forgiveness of sins. It is about the declaration of righteousness. It is about imputed righteousness. 
Mm-hmm. And so there's this very legal theology of salvation and this very relational spirituality. And I got the impression that most of us don't really have much of an idea how those fit together. But in fact, they fit together beautifully. And the people in Christian theological history who have expressed that the best were the fathers of the church in the fourth and the fifth centuries. Mm. So I wanted to write a book that would help Protestant Christians understand that beneath this juridical or legal soteriology that we talk about, focused on justification by grace through faith and imputed righteousness, there's something very personal very relational that lies beneath it and undergirds it. Mm. And it will transform the way we think about our Christian lives if we understand how they fit together. So that's why I wanted to write the book. Yeah. It, it, uh, just to tell you my observation, also it becomes, because it's, it's judicial, it becomes very heartless. <laughs> um, it's, it, uh, it doesn't matter how you feel, it doesn't matter how you live your life, uh, as long as you know this uh, um, It's uh, um, it doesn't transform you. Well, well, this book challenges. I mean, what I read is that it challenges you to 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 be like the Trinity, <laughs> to be like yes. Trinity. Yes, because we we all know we're not saved just to be saved. We know that there's more to it than that, and mm-hmm. we know that becoming Christ-like is important, and developing the fruit of the Spirit is important. But we don't really have a sense of how what we call sanctification, becoming Christ-like, fits together with justification. Mm -hmm. And here again, the church fathers are able to link those. They were able to link those in ways that I think are very helpful and valuable for us to know as well. Uh, uh, Would you consider then um, this, uh, uh, that the, not necessarily the reformers, but the, the reform camp or the Protestant camp, we have um, separated too much sal- uh, salvation with sanctification, while the, the church fathers saw, and I saw that in the book, saw that as a, as a, as a one deal. As a, they both came at the same time. Yes. In general, mm. Protestants for 500 years have been trying very, very hard to be not Catholic. Mm. And there were certainly many, many problems with medieval Roman Catholicism that the reformers needed to reject. But an identity of we are not Catholic sometimes leads us to imbalances or to overstate things. Mm, mm. And one of the places where that can happen is when we emphasize justification so strongly that we get wary of anybody who tries to talk about sanctification or tries to talk about transformation. And so the fact that justification should lead and does lead to transformation is absolutely crucial to Christianity, but we're almost afraid to say that Mm -hmm. lest we sound too Roman Catholic. Yes, my experience. So when we look at the church fathers, we're getting behind the debates between the Roman Catholics and the reformers to ways of talking about this connection that predate medieval Roman Catholicism and that I think are better than the way medieval Roman Catholicism tried to say things, but also in some ways maybe better than the way the reformers tried to say things as well. And so I think this can be very helpful in filling out and rounding out Mm. our faith that is very properly dependent in a lot of ways on the Reformation. So it's not discarding the Reformation like some people may take it, but it's improving um, what, what we receive from the Reformation. Yes, and, and, and to, to some degree, and not necessarily even improving it, but mm. getting back to different aspects of it that we have forgotten. For mm-hmm. example, uh, one of the big ideas of the book, which was a huge idea for the Church Fathers, is the idea of union with Christ. Mm-hmm. But union with Christ was also an enormous idea for Calvin as well. Mm-hmm. Yes. But the centrality of union with Christ in Calvin has to some degree become underemphasized in later Reformed theology. Now, just a minute ago, you, you made a little bit of a distinction between the Reformation and Reformed theology. 
Mm. So Calvin and the Calvinists are not mm. exactly the same in emphasis. Yes. And Calvin very strongly emphasized union with Christ in a way very consistent with the church fathers. But that emphasis has tended to get lost in the shuffle a little bit in later Reformation influenced theology. Mm. Yes. Um, so how do you describe the relationship between the Father and the Son and the, and the, and the Trinity? And in the Trinity, because this is one of the main things that you keep on going back in the book. Okay. The basic idea of the book is that the love that believers are to have for one another is not simply something that we do as a result of the fact that we've been saved. It is true we love because for Christ first loved us. John says that in First John. Mm -hmm. But that's not the whole story. We don't love just because Christ first loved us. In fact, the connection is stronger than just a matter of saying he loved first and we love as a result. The connection is that Christ has loved us with the very love which he has shared from all eternity with the Father. And the key place where Jesus emphasizes this is in the upper room, upper room discourse in John 13, second half of John 13 through John 16, mm -hmm. and then what we call the high priestly prayer in John 17. In John 13, Jesus starts out by talking about the love we are to have for one another, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. But as he goes along in this discourse, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now mm -hmm. remain in my love. This is John 15, 9. Okay, think about what he doesn't say there. He doesn't say, because the Father has loved me, I want you to love each other also. That's true. But he's saying something more than that right there. As the Father has loved me, I have loved you. I have loved you with the same love. Mm. with which the Father has loved me from eternity. What I want you to do is to remain in that love that I have granted you in salvation. So with that central discourse, the upper room discourse and the high priestly prayer as the starting point for the book, I then work backwards and forwards in order to point out that from all eternity, the Father, Son, and Spirit have loved one another. Jesus says in John 17, at the end of the high priestly prayer, that he and the Father have shared oneness and joy and fellowship and love since before the creation of the universe. That's the central reality, the love between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. God created us for a lot of purposes, but mainly that we might share in that. Mm -hmm. When we fell, when we turned away from God, we lost a lot of things, but mainly what we lost was our share in that love, in that relationship. In the act of redemption through the Old Testament, through the New Testament and salvation, what does God give us in redemption? Well, lots of things, but the most important and the most central is that he gives us again a share in that relationship that he gave the human race at the very beginning. So the love mm -hmm. between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is the central, eternal reality that exists. Creation and redemption revolve around that. And the other aspects of what God gives us, like justification and adoption and regeneration and sanctification, etc., all of those revolve around Our sharing in the Father's love for the Son, or, or uh, I mean, I was thinking derives from the from the love he derived from them. Uh, so there, that uh, I, I know that this goes very very much against Reformation theology, but uh, is there? Uh, it looks like justification is that it's love the center. Love is the center. Love is the the main thing, not justification. Justification, we are justified because we're love, not because. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. Oh man, this, this, is, a, this, is, this is the first 15 minutes of this interview has really uh, re revolutionized my mind now. Okay, okay. Well, let me let me try to say it this way. Justification is a central aspect of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Crucially important. Very much in need of being rediscovered mm -hmm. in the Reformation. It is a central aspect. But that is not the same thing as saying that it is the central aspect. Mm. Because it actually depends on something else. Now, that does not mean it happens later. Justification mm. happens at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So does adoption, so does regeneration. All of those happen instantly together at the moment that the Holy Spirit enters a person. But what are they based on? Mm. They're based on something even more fundamental. When the Holy Spirit enters a person as faith begins, what does he do? He unites that person to Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the righteousness of Christ is imputed to that new believer precisely because that believer is united to Christ who is the righteous one. Who possesses the righteousness? Never us. Mm. Always Christ. The Reformation says I mean, that very well. Yes. But the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us because we are united to Christ, the righteous one. Same thing with adoption. We become children of God by adoption because we are united to the one who is the true son. He is the true son, the only son, the natural son, the church father said. Mm. We are the sons and daughters by grace and by adoption. You become an adopted son when the Holy Spirit unites you to the true son. You become righteous in the sense of imputation. Righteousness is imputed to you when the Holy Spirit unites you to the truly righteous one, to Christ. So everything revolves mm. around the person of Christ and his relationship to God the Father. And as that relationship is given to us by the Holy Spirit uniting us to Christ, the things that we normally describe as results of salvation, they follow, but they, they follow immediately. Mm -hmm. The Reformation is certainly not wrong about this. Mm -hmm. And yet they are derived from something even more fundamental. Which is the love of God that between the Son and the Father. Yes. Yes, and, and finally on this, you you mentioned this very rif rif briefly in um in your in, in the first chapter, and maybe we're gonna uh, mention it again later. But uh, theosis, this is uh this years ago, maybe ten, uh, no, no, I'm like maybe fifteen years ago, I mentioned this in my Spanish speaking blog. I used to have, uh, well, uh, uh, the blog is gone now, but I started a new one. Um, but I I, I mentioned theosis, and I was um from a Latin American um, audience, I, I was attacked because I said, oh, you, what are you talking about? You're thinking that we're becoming God. So, so can you explain theosis? Um, maybe you can explain it better than me. Okay. Um, in the book, mm -hmm. I don't translate the word theosis. Yes. I leave it in Greek um, because it's a very controversial word, but theosis is translated as deification or divinization. Mm -hmm. And when a Protestant hears that word in English, we become very upset or very defensive or very mm -hmm. combative about it. And I think a large part of the reason why we are so combative and defensive and upset about it is because we assume that deification means we become gods in the sense of becoming additional persons of the Trinity such that there are no longer three persons, but mm -hmm. there are hundreds or thousands or millions of persons in the Trinity. Now, there are some Christian cults and offshoots of Christianity that have said something like that, but the mm -hmm. church fathers absolutely positively were not saying that. They were not remotely blurring the line between God and us. In fact, in the way I talk about historical theology, I suggest that the very first lesson the church had to learn in the second century was the same lesson that the Jews had had to learn at the beginning of the book of Genesis. There's God, 
and there's everything else. Mm -hmm. And there's a hard line between them. And that line can never be transgressed. We can never rise above that line. God is uncreated. We are created. And we can never become uncreated. So the church fathers learned that lesson very well. And nothing that they said about deification was designed or intended to deny that. God is absolutely unique. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he shares his life with us. He shares his holiness, not to the same degree that he has it, obviously, but he shares his holiness with us. He shares his immortality with us when he saves us. Again, not in the same way that he's immortal. We are immortal by grace if we are saved. <laughs> yes. He is immortal by nature. His life can never be taken away, can never be destroyed. But he shares aspects of his being with us. And most fundamentally, what he shares with us is his relationship to his beloved son. Mm. And so that's why the New Testament links the sonship of Christ and our sonship. God sent his son in order that we might become sons and daughters so that we can call God Abba, Father. You know, think about those passages in Romans 8 and Galatians 4. Mm -hmm. God shares his relationship with his beloved son with us. And in the process, he shares as other aspects of his being with us as well. And all of that is incorporated into this catch-all patristic theological category of thatlessness or deification. Mm -hmm. I think if we properly understand it, we can recognize that some aspects of thatlessness are akin to what we mean when we say personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Some aspects of it are akin to what we mean when we say sanctification. Some aspects of it are akin to what we mean when we say glorification. It isn't really a foreign idea to us. It's just a very strange word, mm -hmm. a word that I freely admit we probably don't want to use ourselves when we're talking among ourselves. But yes. I think the idea of it is something that we can recognize as being important. So, so this would be um, a, a um, controversial word as theotokos has become <laughs> within Christianity as well, without Protestant Christianity, Christianity at least. It's a similar yes. issue. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, I'd like to go on with chapter two. You have explained a little bit regarding um, the heart, uh, chapter two is the heart of the Christianity, the son's relationship to the father. Uh, you already mentioned something on John 13 to 17. Um, and also you have also mentioned um, the prayer because uh, you have mentioned that. I'd like to just um, focus maybe on, on question number two also to, to, to gain some time. So what is the significance of the unity of the Jesus praise it, for in John 17, considering, considering the fragmentation in Christianity, especially verses 11 and 23, um, I come, uh, we're Protestants and, and we're always um, pointed out that, look, you're not the true church because you guys have uh, fragmented um, uh, in many parts. So so what's the unity? Uh, we're still the church, uh, uh, Professor Ferber, <laughs> we're still the churches, even though we're fragmented. Okay, right. Virtually always, when we talk about church unity, and always when we lament the lack of Christian unity, what we are talking about is organizational unity. Mm. We are lamenting the fact, and it is a fact, that the church is divided into thousands of different organizations. Mm. There is no obvious organizational unity uniting the entire church. And so that's what we're thinking about mm. when we think about unity. But I would like to suggest that while that can be important, that isn't what Jesus is even talking about here. Mm. Because Jesus isn't talking about, for example, the Lord's Supper in this passage. And why can't you celebrate the Lord's Supper together? He isn't talking about church government in this passage. 
Why do you have different mm. structures? He isn't talking about anything in this passage that has to do with structure or organizational unity. In this passage, what's he talking about? He's talking about his eternal relationship to the Father. Mm. And so when he says, I pray that they will be one as you, Father, and I are one. That isn't talking about organizational unity. And notice he's also not talking about unity of essence because it is impossible mm. for us to be one with him essentially. Only the three persons of the Trinity share the same essence and can be said to be one essentially. So in one sense, here's organizational unity. He's not talking about that. In another sense, here's essential unity or natural unity. He's not talking about that either. What's he talking about in the passage? He's talking about a unity of love, a unity of fellowship. We are united to him in his fellowship with the Father. And we have the opportunity then to reflect that love in unity in the way we treat other believers, in small spheres, in big spheres. Mm. Now, for some of us who have the privilege of interacting in high level discussions with Christians from other traditions, one of the ways we can manifest that is in the way we try to look for unity among the groups that are organizationally separated. And that's something that's mm. important to me actually. But I think the main way this applies for most Christians is in the relationship with other Christians that God has given us we want to seek to manifest the love between the Father and the Son. Mm -hmm. So the sort of thing that people lament and point to this passage as the seat of their lamentation, I don't think that's really what this passage is even talking about. I think it's talking about something even more fundamental than that and also something that is a lot more in our power as ordinary Christians to try to demonstrate love and fellowship in the way we treat one another that reflects the father's love for the son, which is also the son's love for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. Cause um, usually when we talk about uh, unity, it's either you follow a certain bishop in a certain place or you follow a certain confession of faith or you follow a certain tradition. And, and that's how is that's how we are going to be united, united in Jesus here. Like, as you have rightly said, He's not appealing to any of that. He's appealing to love, <laughs> to love which is eternal. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So it's above that. In chapter three, if you can give us a five minute, <laughs> chapter three is from son's relationship to the father, to the Trinity and back. Uh, could, you this, could you please tell us the development of the Trinity in the church fathers? Uh, maybe, maybe just a peak, um, view, a very short view of, of how the Trinity came about uh, okay. in the first centuries. Okay. First of all, recognize that if you have found yourself bewildered by the doctrine of the Trinity, I would like to suggest that most of what is bewildering about it is a product of the Middle Ages. Mm. And so in order to be really simple, I'd like to go back behind the Middle Ages to the patristic period, to the first several centuries of Christian history and explain it like this. The first point I've already made, what was the first lesson the church had to learn? There's God and there's everything else. Mm. And there's a hard line in between them, eternal, Temporal, created, uh, uncreated, created. The created can enter the temporal, but the uncreated cannot, the, I'm sorry, the uncreated can enter the temporal, but the mm. created cannot become uncreated. That's a hard line. I think we can all understand that. Mm -hmm. And that's what the church had to recognize as it moved out among Gentile pagans, just as the Jews has had, had had to recognize that at the beginning of the, of the Bible in the book of Genesis. So that's the first lesson. But what's the second lesson? The second lesson is, if this is God, 
and this is everything else. And here's this hard line. The sun does not go here. The sun goes here. Mm. The sun is just as eternal as the father, just as uncreated as the father. He is eternally the father's son. He is, in fact, in his attributes, in his character, identical to the father. He goes here. He doesn't go here. If that were not the case, he could not save us. <laughs> if the son were not just as fully God as the father, he could not save us. That's the second lesson. Okay, now the third lesson. Here's God. Here's the created. Here's the hard line. The Holy Spirit does not go here either. Mm. He also goes here. He's just as eternal. He's just as uncreated. He's just as all-powerful. He is, in fact, identical to the Father and Son in terms of his character, in terms of what we call attributes, mm -hmm. theologically. If he weren't, he could not unite us to Christ. Mm -hmm. He could not sanctify us. He could not save us. Over the course of the second, the third, and the fourth centuries, the church articulated very precisely how to make those affirmations that I just made. The church mm -hmm. recognized those affirmations and they developed very particular language in Greek and Latin to make those affirmations. And the Greek and Latin language involved formulas like, for example, the formula that translates one essence, three persons. Mm -hmm. But in the Middle Ages and later, even in Protestant theology as well, we tended to focus on the formulas and the concepts rather than on the persons themselves. But what the early church was focusing on was the persons. So those three mm -hmm. lessons that I've just described essentially constitute the Christian and the patristic doctrine of the Trinity. And then there was a lot more detail about concepts and philosophy and all of those things that came in the fourth century and especially after the fourth century. Mm -hmm. But to boil it all down and to express it in ways that I hope everybody can understand, those are the three lessons. There's the doctrine of the Trinity. And it all emerged in the fourth century as the church elaborated the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, mm -hmm. the Father, the ruler over all. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who is God from God, light from light, light. true God from true God. So it goes up here, it doesn't go down here. Mm -hmm. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, Lord notice the, that the title for God mm. is used of both the Son and the Spirit in the Nicene Creed. They didn't even have to use it of the Father. But they used it of the Son mm. and of the Spirit. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, life. who is worshipped and glorified together with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit goes here, not here. It isn't actually... All that complicated, <laughs> as the church first expressed it. Mm. So there you go. The I think the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. All right. So I am. Um, I think the problem. Uh, I'm a Baptist, so we never say that. I see Creed at church, although I know it. Um, and if I start saying it, they, they, the first thing they say, uh, you sound Catholic. <laughs> But this is what the church um, confess. Uh, and one one thing. I, I was I was uh, looking at somebody um, regarding the Trinity in the first century. This is my um, I want just want to be um, confirmed or corrected. Um, somebody in uh, uh, somebody was saying that um, the the doctrinal um, baptism found in Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Although I have my Greek here and I, and I saw that um, that the uh, US. Um, The Metzger doesn't talk about it, but uh, uh, the well, what he was objecting was that um, the Trinity from Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, and uh, there, there, you know, one oneness Pentecostals also do, do that too, and um, 
And he was saying that the concept of the Trinity came to the fourth century with Nicaea, but Tertullian came up with the uh, with the term, and, and I, I'm trying to understand this. Uh, Tertullian came up with the term. He had to read something <laughs> from uh, from somewhere, uh, and maybe even though we don't have uh, maybe Gospel Matthew a, uh, from the second century uh, manuscripts, I know that they're later, but they must must have been reading something. Uh, in order to to conclude that uh, that there was to come out with Trinitas, yes. Uh, one, one way to think about this mm -hmm. is that the church had a Trinitarian confession from the very beginning. One thing you have to remember is that Lord mm -hmm. was a title for God, the Father. When you use that of the Son as well. You are making a Trinitarian affirmation. You are making an affirmation that the Son goes in the same category mm -hmm. as the Father. That's why Paul says nobody can say Jesus is Lord except through the Holy Spirit. Mm. So there's this Trinitarian confession from the very beginning. What has to develop over time is a Trinitarian theology mm. to help us understand the confession that we've been making all along. The Nicene Creed did not arise out of thin air. Every word in the Nicene Creed except for one comes straight out of the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's entirely composed of phrases out of the Bible. Now, you may be in a church that doesn't particularly like reciting creeds mm -hmm. because you believe that the Bible alone is infallible, and you're right. Mm -hmm that the Bible alone is infallible, and that's a good instinct to have. But it's also helpful to recognize that what Athanasius in the fourth century called gathering the sense of the scriptures into one statement may be useful in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were doing. That's what Athanasius said they were doing at the Council of Nicaea when they put together the first version of what we now call the Nicene Creed. So there's a there's a Trinitarian there's a Trinitarian confession embedded in the New Testament. So it's not invented in the fourth century. What comes in the fourth century is a particular theological language in order to try as best as we can to articulate what we are confessing when we confess the Father, the Son and the spirit. But there's a, a great degree of continuity between the confession mm. yeah, and continuity the is. It is It is simply not mm. true that it was all invented out of nothing in the fourth century. And, and uh, just to finish this point, I, I like to view it as uh, the combustion engine. Mm -hmm. Whoever invented the combustion engine didn't have an idea there was going to be a Lamborghini down the road. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes, that, that, that's the way I see it. And um, that's the way some, uh, most people will understand. <laughs> well, chapter four, life as it was intended. How is the life in the Trinity intended to be recreated? This is the hard part. Like When I read this, okay, this is very hard. How is the life in the Trinity intended to be recreated in humans? Why this did not take place and how God is achieving this now? So in chapter four, and again in chapter 9, which is talking about 9 and 10, which is talking about mm -hmm. salvation, mm -hmm. I, I get into the question of what it looks like or might look like or should look like to reflect the Father's relationship to the Son. And so I suggest, for example, that we see our significance or should see our significance in a different way. Okay, if you, if you look at the way people subconsciously act toward the idea of significance, what do you recognize? They, they think they are significant because they do something great. Mm -hmm. And then if they never do that, they try to become significant by attaching themselves to people that they think have done something great. Mm -hmm. So we try to become famous or attach yes. ourselves to the famous people in order to be significant ourselves. Now, that is 
in many ways completely skewed, but the fundamental intuition of that is exactly right. Your significance depends on whom you belong to. Mm. And so we try to belong to the stars, the, the athletes, the movie stars, the famous people, even though they don't even know who we are. Mm -hmm. But your significance actually comes from the fact that you belong to God who does know who you are, who made you to share in his relationship with his beloved son. So I talk about things like significance that can be transformed when we recognize where does the actual source of significance come from. Another thing I talk about in the book is the way our relationships between people ought to be versus the way they are in the fallen world versus the way they can be again among believers. And one of the illustrations that I use is to talk about leaders and followers. Mm -hmm. We have this idea in our mind, especially in Western societies. And, and, and I'm sorry, I really don't know the degree to which this is there in Latin American culture or Hispanic culture. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's the same. You can tell me whether it is or not. But in okay. Anglo mm -hmm. culture, in Western English speaking culture, we have the idea that if you're a follower, you're nobody mm. and you're unimportant. It's only if you're a leader that you're important. That is absolutely wrong mm. and unchristian. Following is just as important as leading. If you don't believe me, try being in a church that has no followers. Mm. <laughs> I mentioned that I used to work in Ukraine. In the early 90s, a lot of the Ukrainian church leaders who had connections in the West immigrated to Canada, uh, Western Canada and the Western part of the United States. And the churches back in Ukraine were leaderless. They had this flock, they had these followers and they had no leaders. And it was horrible. It was very sad. But it was just as sad in the Ukrainian churches in Canada and the United States where they had 30 preachers and 50 mm. choir directors and 100 elders and no flock. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and that was just as mm. sad. Leading and following are both equally important, equally valuable, should not be seen as demeaning one and exalting the other. Mm. That's the way that's the way relationships were meant to be. That's the way they can be again in the Christian church. So these are the kinds of things that I talk about as ways that we can reflect the relationship between the father and the son. Wow, that's a yes, because uh, also Jesus calls us to be perfect as the father is perfect. So uh, the very challenges that to to live as they live or to reflect the life that they live in them. The next chapter, chapter five, he asked the question, what went wrong? And I have the questions here. What does redemption mean in the context of life in the Trinity? And how do you connect redemption with the Trinity? Okay. And, and this is a, and this is a very Protestant, uh, one of the, um, um, most interesting Protestant uh, themes that uh, redemption. So, I'd like to hear what the church fathers talked about. Okay. Well, I've already said mm -hmm. that the primary thing that we lost when the human race turned away from God was the share in the relationship between the Father and the Son. So, I also I also already said that's the primary thing that God has given us back in salvation. So what does redemption mean in the context of the relationship between the father and son? Remember that to redeem in Greek and English, probably in Spanish also, to redeem means to buy back mm -hmm. yes. so that you belong to the person who has bought you back. 
I mentioned just a minute ago that the most important thing about our significance is whom we belong to. We, by virtue of our sins, belonged to the devil. We belonged mm. to sin. We belonged to death. We were enslaved by our own passions and sinful desires and also by external forces like the forces of the devil. We were in the dominion of darkness, as Paul says in both Ephesians and Colossians. We belonged to darkness. But what has God done? He has transferred us from that ownership to the dominion of his beloved son. We belong to him, not just to a different kingdom, although that's part of it. We belong to the one who has bought us back. Mm. And so that's what redemption means in connection with the love between the father and the son. So it's a, it's a, um, so everything the three of them always working together so because that's my second question how do you connect redemption with trinity so it's the son, the father and the son but the holy spirit uh if you can just give us a comment on that okay yes whenever god does anything all three persons are working perfectly together there are actions of god that we associate particularly with one person or another. But all three persons of the Trinity are working together out of their love for one another to share that love with us in redemption. And so, for example, we, we say correctly, the Son is the one who became incarnate. The Spirit and the Father did not become incarnate. But nevertheless, the Spirit and the Father were just as involved in the incarnation as the Son was. The mm -hmm. Father sent the Son the son willingly came and the spirit brought about the human conception of the son within the womb of Mary. So scripture tells us directly that all three of them are mm -hmm. involved in that saving action, even though the action is particularly talked about with respect to one of the three and not the others. And interesting like, um, to see that three of them involve Because usually we we say this is the first time we see the Trinity is in the in baptism, but now that you have mentioned going back to Luke, going back to Luke one and two, uh, where we see uh, um, the promise and the the inception, the inception of the Jesus coming to to Mary's womb. So there you go, you see the three of them at work right from the beginning of the gospel, even before baptism. Um, yes. That's yes, at the very beginning, you see that in Luke chapter one with mm -hmm. uh, Gabriel's coming to Mary to announce the incarnation, to announce the conception, human conception of Jesus. So mm -hmm. at the very beginning, even before the baptism. So if somebody might want to say Jesus didn't become the son of God or the holy one until the baptism, you need to go back to Luke chapter one to when mm -hmm. Gabriel says to Mary at the Annunciation. Mm -hmm. no, that's yeah. great. That's great because uh, this interview has, has really caused me to think things that I never thought. Uh, this is this is great. <laughs> Chapter mm -hmm. six. It was very interesting because I'm very much into biblical theology, and um, and the question is, uh, well, chapter six, the promise. The question is, how does the church fathers' reading of scripture differ from today's reading of scripture? Okay. The The way we read the Bible today as Christians is somewhat different from the way academic biblical scholars read the Bible. Mm. And the way the church fathers read the Bible is more like the way we do it as regular Christians than like the academic biblical scholars. Mm. So if you think about how regular Christians read the Bible, the way we do it is by making connections and Baptist preachers illustrate this the best. Yes. You start with one passage <laughs> and then you say, the preacher says, and that reminds me and you go to another passage and that reminds me and you go to another passage and another passage and another passage. And pretty soon you've got the whole council of God there together in 30 or 45 minutes. 
in one sermon. Okay, I think that's the way regular Christians understand the Bible if we know the Bible well enough to be able to do mm -hmm. that. The academic biblical scholars tend to look down on that a little bit. And they say, no, we want to understand this passage only in light of its context. Mm. Look at it in light of its own historical background, in light of the language and the grammar of the passage. Don't go jumping to the New Testament right away if you're in an Old Testament passage. And that academic way of looking at the Bible is good because it helps us to really look rather than just assuming we know what the passage is talking about and then jumping somewhere else. Mm. It really does help us to look well at the text. But there's something missing there as well. And that is that the Bible is not about a thousand unrelated chapters. There are about a thousand chapters in the Bible. Mm. Those are not a thousand unrelated little segments to be understood individually. The Bible's one book, it fits together. And at the end of the day, the subject of that one book is the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means that the Old Testament is connected to the New Testament. It means that whatever passage you're looking at in the Old Testament is connected to Christ, indirectly, if not directly. So the church fathers can help to remind us there are connections there all the way through the Bible, that our academic study of scripture doesn't tend to emphasize as much as we might want to emphasize them. Now, I will freely admit that the church fathers saw too many connections. They mm -hmm. saw Christ in every word. They saw Christ in every phrase. They saw the church in every chapter. They saw the spiritual life of the believer on every page of the Old Testament. They were overly exuberant about it. Hmm. But what I would like to suggest is that we should try to gain some of their attitude. The Bible is a book about Christ. Let's see it as being about Christ even if we don't jump to make connections on as many different passages of the Old Testament as we do. Mm. So this is one of the places where I want us to back away from the church fathers a little bit. <laughs> but I would say not as much as our own academic biblical scholars back away. Mm -hmm. Because we really do need to say, the Bible is a book about Christ. So what does this passage in Leviticus genuinely contribute to looking ahead to the incarnation and the ministry of Christ. Okay. So well, what I do in chapter six of the mm -hmm. book is to be a little bit critical of the church fathers, but also to commend their exuberance and to suggest a way of seeing the Old and the New Testament connected that I think can, can do more justice to the texts mm -hmm. than what the church fathers do. So it's kind of in the spirit of the church fathers without doing exactly the same thing. Yeah, great. Yes, uh, as you know, Clie, uh, the the publishing house that has published your book, they have also um, um, published a um, it's a first in the Spanish speaking world. Uh, the church, uh, the church, uh, the Bible uh, with the church fathers' um, comments at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's the idea yeah. to to try to introduce ourselves to our the way they read the Bible. And, but I, and like, they're publishing that in Spanish, is that right? No, they, it's, already, it's already been published. Okay, very good. Published. very good. There's yeah. something like that in English as well. Good. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the IBP, remember the, all, 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 all the, um, all, all, IBP, or I remember uh, all, yes, all those. IBP that does the English one. I, yeah. have it, I have it up here on the show. So. Okay, yes. Well, there's some in Spanish as well. If not most, uh, if not most of them have been translated as well. Okay. Um, so, so there's a, uh, as you can hear, the, the, that's why um, your book was also um, translated because there's a great um, interest in the church fathers from the Protestant okay. point of view, yeah. uh, uh, Spanish-speaking Protestant point of view, and and this is a 
uh, back and forth. Uh, do we read this because these people were Catholics? And some Catholics have mentioned, why are you reading this? This is our people, not yours. And I, and I always go back to say, it. well, uh, my answer to that is, well, we're all children of Abraham. <laughs> Yeah. You know, children and, the, you, and the church fathers this. belong to the whole church. It is, yeah. it is the the relation between the church fathers and any modern communion like Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy is actually quite a complicated one. There's mm-hmm. no there's no direct line between the church fathers and any of the modern communions. There's a history mm-hmm. in between there, and so we have just as much right to seek to learn from the church fathers as Roman yes. Catholics do. They do not own them. We do not mm-hmm. own them either. Yes. But we yes. have the right yes. to learn from them. Just like the Bible is is uh it's is the whole church, just the, the church fathers as well. Yes, that's right. Well, well, chapter seven. Uh, I, I don't know if you have if, if you're in a hurry because we have to we have to go through four more. Uh, well, do we go them in a hurry or do you want to skip or you have time? Um um, I can go a little bit, a little bit longer. Okay, yeah. okay. The incarnation. Then, uh, how uh, chapter seven? How did the church fathers understand the incarnation of the Son, and what challenges arose from the first centuries that misunderstood the person of Christ? And I guess we're going to talk about uh, um, early heresies and how the church fathers dealt with them. Okay, let's go back to this second lesson about okay. the. Mm-hmm. Here's the Father. Here's the hard line. Here are created things. The Son is up here. Okay? So we've already talked about that lesson. Mm -hmm. So any understanding of Jesus Christ that sees him as being created, starting out created, and then somehow ascending to equality with God is wrong. Mm -hmm that would not constitute God coming down to save us. In order for us to be saved, God has to come down. So the son who comes down through the incarnation has to be just as fully God as the father. And the spirit who comes down through Pentecost and indwelling has to be just as fully God as the father and the son. So some heresies, for example, said he was a man and he was adopted to sonship with God. If he's a man who rises up, then he's not God coming down to save us, which means that such a Christ cannot save us. Or some people said that was called adoptionism. Some people, this was called Arianism, said that he's not a man, but he's a created being like an angel who rises up to God and we follow. But if he rises up to God, then he's not God coming down to us to save us. So that's wrong. Other people said, and this is called Nestorianism, the son is just as fully God as the father, but the man Jesus isn't. Mm. He's a man. And the son indwells the man and helps him ascend to God. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit indwells believers and helps us ascend to God. But a man indwelt by the Son can't save us. If you're Mm -hmm. indwelt by God, that makes you saved. It doesn't make you able to save anybody else. Mm -hmm. So Christ is not just a man who's adopted or a man who's indwelt or a creature who rises up. He has to be the very son of God himself, fully equal to the father. But what he also has to do is to really come down and live a human life. I need to do a different set of hand motions now. Okay, so this is not directly connected to the what I've been doing with my hands before. Mm-hmm. This is a divine way of living. So the Father, the Son, and the Spirit from all eternity have lived like this. Okay, this is a human way of living. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is kind of related to what I've done with my hands previously. Before the incarnation, 
the son lives like this mm. in a divine way, loving the father, loving the spirit, creating the world, sustaining the world, doing whatever God does. With the incarnation, he does not stop doing all of this. He does not stop living in a divine way, but he begins to live in a human way as well. He lives as God, he lives as man. The eternal son of God equal to the father lives as God, but he also now lives as man. Mm -hmm. As man, he can die. As man, he can take upon himself the alienation that we deserve for our sins. As man, he can be raised and reunited to the father so that we who are united to him can be united to the Father as well. In contrast to those various misunderstandings that I talked about, adoptionism and Arianism and Nestorianism, the, what the church says is that the eternal Son of God lives as God, and after the incarnation, he also lives as man. Yes, and that's, it is that's through that's the that. human life of yes. the divine Son that our salvation is accomplished. Again, just as with the Trinity, so also here, I just said it without the terminology. Mm -hmm. The terminology was complicated. The terminology was controversial. But I've tried to say it just with the concepts, not with the terminology, in order to help you see this really was the consensus of what the church was saying on the basis of the New Testament on the basis of the word of God. The terminology has to do with what words you're going to use for the one person, the son of God. Yeah. What word you're going to use for his humanity in which he lives and dies and is raised. And therefore, what word you're going to use for the nature of God and the persons of the Trinity. All of that was complicated. All of that took a while to figure out. But the basic idea that I've tried to explain with all my hand motions was really not particularly complicated. The great heresies where they went wrong was that in one way or another, they saw Christ as somebody who helps us save ourselves, mm -hmm. not as God who comes down to our human condition to save us. And the church in response to all of them said the same thing. He had to be God mm -hmm. and he had to really become human to save us. Again, it's uh, really not that complicated. Yes, I remember when, uh, I don't know if you know Graham Cole, he, he used to, to teach at Beeson in uh, mm -hmm. Trinity as well. And uh, he, he was my, uh, my, one of my theology uh, lecturers. Like, I remember when the first time I heard, as you have said, Jesus stay a man after the resurrection. It, a, um, um, a new body, of course, but, uh, but he's still human. He's still, still man. <laughs> um, yes. He still had the wounds yes. in Revelation 5. Yes. Still, and when in John 20 and in Revelation 5, he still has the wounds. Yes. And, uh, and I said, and I, my, and I never thought of, of that, about that. I mean, you read the Bible, but you sometimes you don't, you, you, you don't see the implications of what you're reading. And, uh, and that, that's what became also an issue, uh, like I told you before uh, we started uh, uh, recording in Latin, in Latin American um, This is what's going on about Nestorianism. And, and people say, well, Mary stopped being the mother of God after the resurrection because Jesus, uh, because of what Paul says in, I remember now, first or second Corinthians, if we knew Jesus by the flesh, we don't know him anymore like that. And I, and I, made, and I made a video about it saying, well, this is not what, uh, signing all the scholars, this is not what he's talking about. Um, yeah, it's not. He's, he's talking about the way we perceive him. We previously mm -hmm. perceived him only in a human way as the man walking around Galilee in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now we see him fully as who he is, which is God, who's also fully human. That's what Paul's yes. talking about there. Yes. Yes. And after the resurrection, like you said in Revelations, he still has wounds. He still um, he still has flesh, and, and, and this is a, something that in Luke as well, he even eats with him in order to convince them that yes, I'm not a, I'm not a ghost, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an apparition, I'm, I'm not a vision, I, I'm, I'm real. Um, so this is a, 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 a 
continuation of Jesus as as a man um, mm -hmm. after the resurrection. Uh, I think that's something that that's why he can understand us fully, fully understand us. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Well, chapter eight, uh, the church and the Trinity. Two questions here. Uh, how did the son achieve, what did the son achieve in the cross? And I guess that you are aiming at theories of what we call today theories of atonement. And number two, how are we to understand the death of the son? And you already answered this. Did God die? And, and one thing, because you really, really uh, struck me when you said God, uh, the son incarnated, he can die. In terms he, of his humanity. In terms of humanity. He couldn't before. Yeah, thinking about before. him this way. Yes. He can't die and he doesn't. Mm -hmm. Thinking about this same person this way, he can and he did. And I freely admit, <laughs> we can't fathom that. Yes, yes. But that's what we need to say. Hmm. Because that's what scripture says and that's what was necessary for our salvation. So the the person who died was the eternal son of God. But he died in terms of his humanity. Man. If you want to say it this way, as man, he was alienated from the father while at the same time as God not being alienated from the father. How that's possible, I have no idea. But that is what happened. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And that's what we need and to even, say. And even Paul says uh, in, um, in, in, in the pastorals, it's, it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> we understand it. So, 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 yeah. So, you answered the second question. So, what did the son achieve in the cross? Okay. According to the church fathers, what did he achieve? Um, without getting too deep into theories of the atonement, mm. I think we need to recognize that the idea of substitution or sacrifice for guilt is central. And the idea of victory over the powers of sin, death, mm -hmm. and the devil is also very important. Why was it that sin, death, and the devil had power over us? Because we were guilty before God because of our sin. So the captivity that we were under because of our sinfulness is a result of our alienation from God, of our guilt, if you want to use that word for it. And so the way God wins the victory is precisely by overcoming the guilt mm. through the sacrifice of his son. So when the son goes through alienation from God as a man for our sin, not his own because he didn't have any, but when he undergoes alienation from God for our sin, that takes upon him the full penalty of our sin. Then when he's raised, he's restored to the Father. Now as God, he was never separate. But as man, he was alienated. But now as man, he is restored to the Father. Which means that we who were guilty because of our sin, who were alienated from the Father because of our own sin, can also be restored if... Mm -hmm we are united to him. Mm -hmm. And so it is in his person that the atonement is wrought. And it is in his person that salvation happens. We are saved, forgiven, adopted, regenerated when we are in him. Because it is in him that the victory is won, that the guilt is removed. And that comes to us, that victory, that removal of guilt comes to us when we are in him, which is why on every page of Paul's writings, his favorite expression is in Christ, in Christ. or Christ in us. We are in Christ. He in is us. He is in us over and over and over again on every page. He says that. We need to slow down in a reading enough to see how prominent those expressions are. We are forgiven when we are in Christ. We become adopted children when we are in Christ. 
The righteousness of Christ is imputed to us when we are in Christ. It's not an abstract transaction. Mm -hmm. It takes place in him. So when the son goes through death and resurrection and ascension as a man, we who are united to him go through that as well. Which is why Paul says in Romans 6 that we are buried with Christ in baptism and raised with him mm. to new life. Yes. But you mentioned something about the victory as, as well, because, uh, you know, the that's what, that was one of the early um, positions of the Church Fathers, uh, not... Uh, not uh, actually, um, well, the main, because uh, uh, what I read is the, the, the King Christus picture. That was, was one of the main themes that they had. Can you just mention something about that? Yes. The victory is accomplished by the substitutionary sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Where the idea of victory becomes mistaken, in my opinion is when people think that God had to trick the devil mm, yes. <laughs> or even overpower the devil in order to get the devil to set us free. Well, God doesn't ever have to trick anybody. God can do like that to the devil and the devil has to mm. leave. Mm -hmm. The only reason the devil had any authority over us was because we had alienated ourselves from God. Through the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ, God overcomes the alienation. He pays the penalty in our modern terminology. And the very fact that the penalty is paid, the very fact that Christ has been alienated and restored, means that the devil does not have authority over us anymore. The victory isn't won by some grand battle the victory is won by the death. Mm -hmm. if, if I can, if this is something that people will recognize, notice here the difference in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe between mm -hmm. the book and the movie. In the book, the climactic battle is one paragraph that basically says it was no better at all, battle at all. Mm -hmm. The victory had been won in the death and resurrection of Aslan. Mm. The battle was just the public announcement of the victory, the public stomping on the feet of the White Witch, if you mm. will. Yeah. Well, not in the movie. The movie, of course, is, is done by Hollywood. They have to draw out this battle and make the outcome be in doubt. Yes. All very nice for a movie, but completely wrong theologically. The death and the resurrection won the victory. The victory was assured then, as C.S. Lewis gets right in the book and in the movie, embellishes in exactly the wrong way, although it's a very predictable way why the movie would do that. Mm. Yes, yeah, so, well, yeah, yeah, because they, they want to have um, action. <laughs> well, chapter nine, Becoming a Christian. Can you elaborate the concept of theosis? You have done that at the, right at the beginning, so thank you very much. So the second question is, how do you differentiate between the Western and Eastern perspectives on deification, which is theosis? <laughs> um, generally, speaking, generally speaking, the Western church doesn't use the word theosis, mm -hmm. doesn't use the word deification, and tends to separate the aspects of salvation and talk about them separately. Mm. So justification and sanctification, they're kept separate. Conceptually, that's understandable. But in reality, mm. none of it is separate. Mm -hmm. And so I really like the church father's way of linking it all together, as I've been trying to talk about. We are united to Christ, who is the righteous one. And so his righteousness is imputed to us. Mm. Modern Eastern theology in my opinion, doesn't emphasize the beginning of faith enough. It's too focused on the end and it makes it sound like a human task mm -hmm. without focusing enough on the beginning, adoption, regeneration, justification. And, and so I think that's a problem. 
But in Western theology, it can be a bit of a problem if we separate those too much and don't recognize they're all connected to union with Christ. And so the way I've tried to talk about them, learning from the church fathers, has been to distinguish the concepts a little bit, but to emphasize that they're all aspects of the same reality of mm. salvation. And that's, that's the way I'd like us to try to think about it. Union with Christ, when you think about it legally, it implies justification. When you think about it relationally, it implies adoption. But union with Christ is actually at the heart of all of it. And, and one thing is uh, now that you, you, because you keep, in, in the book also keeps going back to relationship. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, like I told you before we started, uh, I'm, a, I'm a new perspective guy. And that's one of the things, at least maybe this is my own take on the new perspective, but uh, I see that the new perspective is trying to put more relational um, and, and having, and having um, because, uh, you, you know, in the U here, when, when Americans uh, came to a church, I was uh, here at a local church, at Werribee Church. I live seven Ks from Werribee, um, kilometers, remember? That was like three and a half, four miles. And, um, and he came in and he was amazed because our church had, Every single like Africans, Middle Easterns, Latinos like me, um, Europeans from everywhere, and we were all in one church. Well, in in the U.S. and I remember this too. In the U.S., it it, it takes place, but not as much as as here. Um, in in and just in in this the view I see uh, the perspective is to 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 break barriers. And, and also what we're talking about with this um, with this deification, with this sanctification, everything we get at the same time. So we so we all all walking together towards one end. Uh, and like you said, sometimes uh, we Westerners, because I grew up in Western, so I don't. <laughs> and from ten years old, I'm being in the Western in, in the Western world. So uh, we we emphasize too much on the end and how we're going and not how we can walk to towards all together towards the that end. And that's where I see um, the differences, the the ruptures in relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, that's my take on this. Uh, and right. and okay. a lot. Okay. Yes. Well, to finish then, <clears throat> chapter 10. And this is the practical thing that we as, as Christians, we also, uh, I remember that when I, w I was doing my theological studies, I always wanted to talk only about academics. And one of the things that the professors always told me, no, how do you apply this to your Christian life? Um, how can we cultivate a relationship with with each of the members of the Trinity, which is uh, which is a tricky question because I would, they would always ask me, do I pray to the Holy Spirit? Um as that to a Pentecostal, of course. <laughs> As that to a Baptist, mm, not likely. Um, yeah, how do we relate to each other and how can we reflect the life within the Trinity in a fallen world? Okay. Um, regarding cultivating relationships, um, recognize that we have a, a particular pattern by which we're told to pray. Mm. Pray to the Father in the name of the Son at the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And that is perfectly fine. That is perfectly acceptable. But I think it is also valuable to address different persons in prayer at different times, to address Jesus directly, to address the Holy Spirit directly, of course, to address the Father directly. But if we're going to do that, we need to be thinking about what we're doing. Mm. don't thank Jesus for sending his son to die for us. Mm. If you're going to say that, address that to the Father. Don't thank the Father for dying on the cross for you. Don't thank the Holy Spirit for being incarnate in the world. Pay attention as you address different persons of the Trinity. Think about the ministries that are particularly associated with them as you pray and simply thinking about that and focusing on what to say to each person in light of that person's particular ministry, that can help to deepen our appreciation of all three persons. And also it can help to sharpen 
our prayers. Now, of course, if if we bungle it all up and accidentally mm-hmm. thank the Father for dying on the cross for us, remember that the Holy Spirit is editing our prayers in Romans chapter eight. So don't, so don't worry about it. But if you want to to meditate on the Father and address prayers to him, meditate on the Son and the uniqueness of what the Son does and address prayers to him. For example, pray to the Son thinking about how extraordinary it is that he knows experientially everything that you are going through in your life. Mm. Address the Holy Spirit thinking about how extraordinary it is that he dwells within you, that he knows your heart and your mind better than you do and is better than you at speaking to the Father on your behalf. Mm-hmm. So I think those are some ways that we can yes, yes, yes. use prayer to sharpen our appreciation for each of the persons and therefore for all three persons together. Mm-hmm. Reflecting the life of the Trinity in a fallen world. Um, one thing to recognize is that life in a fallen world includes suffering. That's one of the most universal aspects mm-hmm. of life in a fallen world. And recognize that we suffer as well. We are not exempt from the suffering Mm. because we do not have to pay the eternal penalty of the fallen world. We still have to live in the fallen world. We still have to live with the results of other people's sin in our own. We have to live with the results of collective effects of the fall. And so do all the people that we work with. And so in, in John chapter 17, we get a vision of the perfect fellowship between the Father and the Son in eternity. But throughout the New Testament, we also recognize that as the Son shares his Father's love with us in a fallen world, that involves immense suffering mm-hmm. on his part. And when we share the Father's love for the Son with those around us that often involve suffering for us as well. There will come a time when every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more suffering. There will not be no more dying. There will be no more pain, but not yet. Not yet. And recognize that just as that sharing involves suffering in Christ's sake, it also is going to involve suffering in our sake, in our case. But that's a privilege. It's not just a yes. It's mm. an extraordinary privilege to bear the love of the Father for the Son to a fallen world. And, and going just to closely with the church fathers, they were aware that their allegiance to the Father, to, 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 to God, meant suffering even to death. Yes, in some cases. Mm-hmm. Yes. In many cases, in fact, at different times, different places. Mm. Um, And even more so today in many parts of the world. Yes. Yes. We are living through the the greatest period of Christian persecution, persecution of Christians in history right Mm. now. And also the greatest period of the growth of the church in history at the Mm. same time right now. Yes. Uh, the the blood of the of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that's what they. I remember which 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 your father used to say that. Uh, um, one of them, one of them. The, I don't remember quite who who said that one. Who said what? Uh, the, uh, uh, that was okay, yes, the blood yes. of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Yes, that was Tertullian. Tertullian. Yes, yes. I didn't want to get it wrong, so I was waiting for you to answer it. <laughs> yes. Well, end of the second. Uh, yes. Well. Uh, Life in the Trinity, Vida en la Trinidad, uh, una introducción a la teología con la ayuda de los padres de la iglesia, an introduction to theology with the help of the church father by Professor Donna Febern. Thank you. Can you stay just one minute after we finish and, and so, so we can uh, just assess what we've done? Um, and thank you very much for this interview. And, and to those who, are, who have uh, seen the video, I hope that they can... Uh, 
uh, get the book, you see the link uh, both to the Spanish and English version because I also upload this to my English um, to my English channel. Uh, so you can have a look and you can purchase the book if you want. Professor Fairburn, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Thank you.